Morant with a running start. Elevate! Oh, oh, it does! Oh, my goodness! Oh. He's done a tie game in overtime. Gasol will turn his heat. It's gone! It's Gasol top. Seven tenths remain. Only now a three. Count it! A 15-point lead for Memphis. And Blake Griffin gets into it on the floor with Randolph. Hard to tell if there are any punches being thrown under there, but Griffin took exception. Adams going long. Morant! Oh, he hit it! He hit it! He hit it! John Morant! Insanity! You gotta be kidding me. Welcome to Grits and Grinds, a Memphis Grizzlies podcast. My name is Keith Parrish. Happy New Year's, everybody. The Grizzlies have lost a few in a row now after winning their first four games with John Morant. They've now dropped three straight. One of those was without John Morant, but their last two, some dispiriting losses. They lost on the road to the Clippers in a game that was basically a blowout. It got moderately competitive in the fourth quarter. Then they returned home on New Year's Eve to face a Sacramento Kings team that uh, mopped the floor with the Grizzlies. It was a ugly, embarrassing home loss. So on this episode, I'm going to talk mainly about the Kings game and then kind of just have some overall impressions of the last few games before I get there. Just a reminder, if you want to support the creation of this program, do it at patreon.com slash fast break breakfast. That's the most direct way to support this show. If you sign up over there for $5 a month, you can join the Slack channel. We have a grits and grinds exclusive Slack channel where we talk about Grizzlies things around the clock. I might give some opinions there. I don't share in other social media or even on air here. So if you want to support the show you want to get access to bonus content you want to join the slack channel do it all patreon.com slash fast break breakfast the grizzlies loss to the kings was their first full strength quote unquote full strength game of the year of course we're not including brandon clark or steven adams but they had luke Kennard available to play alongside John Morant and Desmond Bain and Marcus Smart and Jaron. Also, Derek Rose returned from his injury. So a lot of us were thinking, all right, what's the rotation going to look like? How good is this going to be? Well, it was not good. It was awful. The Grizzlies picked up their eighth blowout loss of the season. We're defining blowout losses as by 20 or more points. The Grizzlies have the most of those in the NBA. More than the Wizards and the Pistons and the Spurs. Grizzlies have eight losses this year already by 20 or more points. The Grizzlies got out-rebounded by 25. The Grizzlies have four games this season where they've been out-rebounded by 20 rebounds or more. That's tied with the Wizards with the most such games. I mean, the Grizzlies are 2-12 and at home. What's going on there? But this one was pretty basic i mean the grizzlies struggle to shoot once again which is again a defining feature of the year just bricking three-pointers luke Kennard's return you're like oh good maybe our three-point shooting won't be as terrible luke Kennard made five out of eight three-pointers luke Kennard had a season high 17 points everybody else was seven for 32 The overall team number is 12 out of 40 on three-point attempts, 43-point attempts. Circle that number. It's been horrible all year when the Grizzlies shoot that many three-pointers. The Grizzlies did not score in the paint. When John Morant came back, all of a sudden our points in the paint were like, oh, we scored 62 points in the paint. We had that 70 points in the paint one game. We had, you know, we're always over 50. The Grizzlies had 31 points in the paint, and I honestly, I don't know why. Why aren't they attacking? I mean, credit the Kings for shutting down the paint, but the Kings do not have rim protection. The Kings were able to keep the Grizzlies players in front of them, and Grizzlies players, for whatever reason, were comfortable with just settling for jumpers. 31 points in the paint. A lot of that's because you shoot 40 three-pointers. You keep shooting this league-worst three-point percentage. I mean, they've been flirting with some other teams. Like, they keep jockeying back and forth for the worst three-point percentage. But, like... 
the Grizzlies don't make three pointers. Specifically, they don't make corner three pointers. The Grizzlies on the year still last in the NBA in corner three point percentage. They're at thirty two point five percent on corner threes. The worst team in the NBA last year on corner three pointers made thirty five percent of them. You have to go back to the 2016-2017 season to find a team that shot 33% or worse on corner threes. I mean, there's a long way to go in the season. That number surely has to come up. It can't be this bad all year. But the Grizzlies three-point shooting, I think it can be this bad all year. They're bad shooters shooting. Luke Kennard made his threes. Desmond Bain... Made his threes. Desmond Bain was three out of seven. Kennard's five out of eight. Even John Morant, who could not make three-pointers. He even hit two. After the second Pelicans game, by the way, John Morant joked if he could make three-pointers, he'd be averaging 40 points per game. It was a good joke. It was more funny uh, before Ja posted 19 points against the Clippers and then 17 against the Kings. But Ja, Desmond, and Luke made three-pointers. 10 for 19 out of those guys. Everybody else, 2 for 21. And what exacerbated the three-point shooting problem and the poor shooting performance is the utter lack of rebounds. The Grizzlies had one offensive rebound. They missed 52 field goal attempts. They missed 28 three-point attempts and only got One offensive rebound. That feels impossible. The idea with three-point shooting, some of it is there's a lot of long rebounds. You might offensive rebound three-pointers a little higher percentage than some other shots. The Grizzlies could not chase down offensive rebounds. Some of that randomness. It's not always going to be that terrible. A lot of that is, and this is like tapping the sign of things we've said all along, bad rebounders are playing. I mean, Jaron, I've defended Jaron, where I'm like, his rebounding numbers aren't that bad. When you look at, like, per possession, and then you look at the role he plays on the team. But Jaron, you got to grab some rebounds, my friend. Jaron has had four or fewer rebounds in four of the last five games. In this one, he had three rebounds, 18 points, three rebounds, zero blocks. By the way, Jaron has had zero blocks in five out of the last eight games. Not totally sure what's that about. By the way, in the Clippers game, he got two blocks. So he finally passed Stromal Swift for the third most blocks in Grizzlies franchise history. Took him a long time. Well, uh, he got right on the cusp and then kind of stopped blocking shots. But this Grizzlies team does not rebound. And like the one offensive rebound, uh, just a stark number. It's the fewest any team has had in any game this year in the NBA. So some of it is randomness. Some of it, sure, blame Jaron. The rest of it, a lot of it is roster and rotation decisions. Now, I made a sort of prediction slash hope what I thought the rotation would look like when they were fully healthy. I thought we would cede most of Zaire's or Conchar's minutes to Luke Kennard. And we would be able to boost our three-point shooting. We would still work in Vince Williams Jr. a good bit off the bench. And you could play like nine guys and I think be very competitive. Um, They did not exactly do that. They did play a nine-man rotation against the Kings, at least until they got desperate in the second half. But much to my surprise, I don't know why I keep getting surprised, much to my surprise, Derek Rose was one of the guys used. Like, we knew they were going to use Kennard, We knew they were going to use Aldama. Most of us figured they wouldn't, like, pull Vince out of the rotation. And so we're like, all right, so you're going to play Vince. You're going to play Aldama. You're going to play Kennard. I thought they'd play Tillman. They did not play Tillman. And they actually played Derek Rose instead of any of the other options, like Zaire or Roddy. I thought it was a very interesting slash uh, disappointing decision to play Derrick Rose as your fifth guard. His skills, in my mind, overlap too much with the other players you have. And when you have John Morant and Marcus Smart and Desmond Bain and Luke Kennard, why are you playing a fifth guard? I thought that was weird. 
Now, the benefits of Derrick Rose is he can normally beat his guy off the dribble. He can create for other people. He did a little bit of that, but the things he takes off the table, which is not a rebounder, not a defender, I feel like the fit would be better if you went with like more Vince Williams Jr. minutes or even like, honestly, even Zaire Williams minutes or John Conchar. I think John Conchar is a better fit for this team based on what they needed in this game than Derrick Rose. You already should have all the guard minutes covered. However, Derrick Rose's role in this one was just backup point guard. Which again, when fully healthy, when the roster's fully healthy, I don't think a lot of us thought Derrick Rose would actually be the backup point guard. We all mistakenly thought Marcus Smart is going to cover the backup point guard minutes. Nope. It was Derrick Rose. And Derrick Rose played 12 minutes. Was one out of three from the field, all in the paint. All those attempts were in the paint. He wasn't the one shooting three-pointers. But had two points, three assists, one turnover. It seemed less than ideal. The three-guard lineup. So they start Smart and Bain and Ja. All right, we've accepted that. That makes sense. It works for me. Even though I don't love, I still don't love the fit with Marcus Smart. Maybe more on that in a second. But like those three start, and then Kennard comes in in this game. Kennard came in for Marcus Smart, but like Derrick Rose had already checked in. So then you have Derrick Rose and Luke Kennard, so you're a little bit small already on the perimeter or in the backcourt, and you're playing them with a third guard. Basically, the whole first quarter he did, the whole first quarter, that was what happened. It was three guard lineups the whole time. And then in the second quarter, okay, Vince Williams Jr. checks in. Good. Happy to see it. Um, and they work with the rotations, and I, I I don't mind them outside of the Derrick Rose minutes. I think those minutes need to go to a defender and a rebounder, and I know your roster doesn't have maybe the perfect option, but I would rather see Conchar get those minutes. I would rather see Zaire Williams get those minutes, but mainly I would rather see, I think, Xavier Tillman get those minutes don't play small ball I don't think you need to play your centers I think I mean they did a pretty good job honestly of keeping two of the three of their bigs on the court at all times like they weren't doing a lot of only one big lineups they did play a couple minutes with just biz as like the only big guy no not a fan no thank you even if it was Vince Williams Jr. getting the minutes at the four like I think you gotta have Two bigs on at all times. And I also feel like you probably want to be playing Xavier Tillman just because he's a little bit more of a threat as a big. He will actually look to shoot sometimes like Bismack. Bismack has just stopped looking at the basket altogether. And teams don't have to guard him. And he's not offensive rebounding enough for it to matter. Like he got six defensive rebounds. The only person who got an offensive rebound in this game Xavier Tillman. I'm not saying that as any kind of argument for why you should play Xavier Tillman. That might have just been a random play. But like Bismack is not creating enough second chance opportunities, I think, to make up for the fact that he never looks at the basket. You would think Bismack is a better screener than Tillman, but they're not using Bismack that much in pick and roll games. I was a little bit surprised they even started Bismack Biombo. In the second half against the Clippers, he got a DMP. They switched over to Xavier Tillman. And I was like, all right, finally, they're going to switch back to Xavier Tillman. He's probably going to take the minutes of Bismack Biombo. Well, no. Um, they went back to Bismack, and it was Tillman in the game against the Kings picking up the DMP. Now, I don't really care that much between Tillman and Biombo. They both have positives and negatives, and neither one, frankly, is good enough. Personally, I would pick Tillman between the two, but again, that part doesn't bother me as much. What bothers me more is the dependence on these lineups where the skill sets overlap too much. Like, this goes back to the Marcus Smart problem. The problem with Marcus Smart, for me, is his strengths are overlapping too much with Ja and Desmond. He's shooting the basketball too much, in my estimation. I know he had that incredible game against the Pelicans. He was absolutely awesome in that game where he had the six stocks, made a bunch of huge plays. But the lineup fit with Marcus so far, I don't think has worked that well 
And a lot of it is because he shoots the ball so much. This is one of the reasons I preferred Vince Williams Jr., where Vince Williams Jr. makes it his life's mission to just defer and give the ball to Ja, Jaron, and Dez. Every shot Marcus Smart shoots is a shot that Ja, Dez, and Jaron are not shooting. And the numbers right now for Marcus Smart lineups, it's pretty bad. Right now, when Marcus Smart is on the court with both Jaron Jackson Jr. and Desmond Bain, the Grizzlies' offense is terrible. The Grizzlies have a 104 offensive rating when Marcus Smart, Desmond Bain, and Jaron Jackson Jr. all play together. That's weirdly low. Like, maybe some of it is shooting randomness. Of course, the team doesn't shoot the ball well, but they have a bad effective field goal percentage. They have a terrible offensive rating. They have hideous offensive rebounding numbers. Of course, uh, those were amplified after this game. They're only recovering under 20% of their missed shots. That's in the second percentile, according to Cleaning the Glass. So quite bad numbers there. Their defensive numbers are fine. They're actually forcing a lot of turnovers. They give up a 110.5 um, offensive rating to their opponents. So they have a good defensive rating, but their offensive rating is terrible. And I'm not going to lay it all at the feet of Marcus Smart because it seems like this is the offense by design. It's just a spam three-pointers, and so far, it hasn't worked out well. I think Marcus would work better. Like, I'm not saying don't close games with him. Absolutely, that's fine. Close games with him. I value how he can create his own shot. We've seen it a lot recently where he overpowers some guards on the other team where he gets into the paint, he rises up and shoots these like eight footers, these 10 footers, and he's making them. I value his ability to defend. I value his ability to create his own shot. But too much of the time, I'm like, I want Jaron to touch the basketball. I want Ja Morant to touch the basketball. I want these possessions to end up with those guys shooting, not Marcus. And it's still a balance they got to work out, and they might. But so far, the returns have been very underwhelming. And then you look at the fact that the Grizzlies are 3-12 and 12 in games that Marcus Smart plays. That's brutal. That's some tough stuff. Now... You know, my favorite guy who I wish they played more, I'm always saying it's Vince Williams Jr. Vince Williams Jr. also is just struggling now with his shot. The regression came in full force, and he's in a pretty big shooting slump. Last six games, Vince has only made four out of 24 of his three-pointers. So Vince's shots aren't going in at all. Um, Don't let me highlighting his negative shooting. um, Don't let that be interpreted as me saying I want him to play less. No, I I want him to play more. I want him to play more with Ja and Dez and Jaron. Let's move Marcus and Luke to the second unit, I think, or just stagger the minutes more. Again, it doesn't matter who you start as long as you rotate these things in and out. Um, But right now, I think the decision to play Derek and Marcus and Luke and Ja and Desmond, of course, you're going to play Ja, Desmond, and Marcus. I don't have any problem with that. And And I'm fine with playing Luke Kennard. Just adding that fifth guard I don't think works. Just one game, but uh, in my mind, I don't think it works. And then watching the game, I'm like, nope, this uh, this actually does not work. But then you also just got to get better games from your guys. I mean, maybe John Morant still having some effects of his illness where he had subpar games against the Kings and the Clippers. Maybe some of this Kings game was that whole traveling back home, going west to east. Last episode, I mistakenly thought, for whatever reason, this Kings game was a road game. It wasn't. They returned home. They played the effects for him. But I've highlighted it many times. When you come back from a West Coast road trip, those first games back home are normally bad. If you want to make that the excuse for this one, it works. The shoe fits because this game was very Very terrible. Now, maybe even more concerning for me, it's not just that the team, you know, didn't rebound. It's that they chose to play these lineups where I'm like, well, those lineups are not going to rebound. I also was pretty frustrated where in the second half um, against the Kings, they actually didn't play Vince Williams Jr. They went with David Roddy. I don't want that ever. And now I guess you defend it by saying, listen, you're losing. Maybe they're thinking this is like the lottery scratch-off strategy where maybe we get lucky and David Roddy makes three three three-pointers in a row or something and gets us back into the game. I mean, I guess that makes sense, except, 
I have seen zero on-court evidence that David Roddy is more likely to hit three threes in a row than like Vince Williams Jr. is. I think you got to lean on rebounders in defense. I'm going to keep saying this. I'm a broken record a little bit. Um, I've been doing it for years now where you have your superstars, you have Ja, you have Desmond, you have Jaron. You need the complimentary pieces. I mean, ideally, we would find another clear-cut starter at the three. Maybe it is Marcus Smart. I mean, I would imagine, ideally, you'd find a forward with more size. I mean, it's not OG Ananobi as um, the trade market kicked off with a slightly rare December trade. OG Ananobi going to the Knicks for Emmanuel Quickly and R.J. Barrett. But, like, ideally, maybe your starting three would be, you know, not just a connective piece, would be a little bit more of a talented player, like a fourth guy in your pecking order. Um, and then, of course, your center position. Feels like you got to do something there. But in the absence of these upgrades, in the absence of any roster changes, I think to make the, the players work together better, you have to find complementary pieces. And so far, Marcus Smart has not been a complementary piece. He's more of, I don't know what the word is or the terminology you'd want to use. He's been a little bit more than that. He is shooting the basketball a lot. He's calling his own number a lot. And it hasn't been an additive thing yet. Maybe uh, eventually it will be. Now, looking at Roddy's performance in the second half against the Kings, like when he played, did he do anything? No. No, in the non-garbage time minutes, Roddy played six minutes, had zero points, zero rebounds, one assists. And it all goes back to we don't have many options that we can trust outside of our top eight. And now I think you're you're dealing with some frustration. You're dealing with the overall weight of this tough season. Like maybe that has some effect on it. But for whatever reason, the Grizzlies keep getting blown out. They were disappointing at home once again. And I feel like the coaching staff is struggling trying to find the right answers. Like, my opinion is I would start John Morant, Desmond Bain, Vince Williams Jr., Jaron, and Xavier Tillman. I would have Marcus Smart be my sixth man. I would close with John Morant, Desmond Bain, Marcus Smart, and Jaron. And then for the fifth guy, I'm basically picking between Xavier Tillman or maybe Bismack Biombo or maybe Santi Aldama or maybe Vince Williams Jr. Now, that is just you feeling how the game's going. I think you look at who your opponent is and how you're playing. But my opinion is start Ja, Des, Jaron, and then Tillman because Tillman, again, more of an offensive threat better passer is going to actually look to score. I don't know if the difference in rim protection or screening or rebounding matters that much. I think maybe the upside of Tillman is a little bit better. That's why I would choose Tillman. Now, if you don't start Vince Williams Jr. and you start Marcus, again, you can stagger it. So I think the Lions make a little bit more sense later in the game. But even if you don't start Marcus or Vince, I'm fine with starting John Conchar. I'm looking for a low usage connective piece who can get rebounds. For me, that's either John Conchar or Vince Williams Jr. When you start Bismack, I do feel like it's a little bit rough having two absolute non-scores on the court. So like if Bismack's playing, all right, maybe I understand, don't start Vince. But even so... I do think with Ja and Desmond and Jaron, you can probably survive that. But my two cents, start Vince Williams Jr., start Xavier Tillman, and then your bench unit, you have Marcus Smart, you have Luke Kennard. I would say whatever center you don't use is on there. In this situation, I'm saying Bismack Biombo. I'm also saying Santi Aldama. That's my nine deep lineup. Now, they went nine deep against the Kings. They've gone nine deep way more this year than they have in previous seasons. Against the Clippers, they actually went 10 deep. They played Roddy and Zaire uh, and Vince, all these guys off the bench in that one. But my nine deep, I'm saying Marcus, Luke, Santi, and Biz are coming off the bench. If I'm going 10 deep, then I would honestly go, I would go Zaire Williams because I still want to see some Zaire Williams. I like the size. I feel like other NBA teams are playing fewer small ball lineups, and I still like the idea of him being paired up in some 
units with John Morant so he can provide that spacing with his alley-oops. He can cut baseline and just be a finisher and transition, all that stuff that he, the positive things that he does that are unlocked by John Morant, I'd like to see that. If it's not Zaire, who cares? Let's go with Conchar or Roddy or whatever. I'm not going with another small guard. Another thing that they have not tried hardly at all this year that I'm not opposed to, it's starting Santi Aldama. Start Santi Aldama alongside Jaron Jackson Jr. in the front court. In my mind, if you do that, you put Vince or Conchar at the three. Even if you had Marcus Smart, I'm not opposed to it. That is a lot of shooters or people who like to shoot the basketball, but I'm not opposed to starting John Morant, Desmond Bain, Marcus Smart, Santi Aldama, and Jaron Jackson Jr. I just think it balances out the needs of each lineup and makes sure that you have a balance of each five-man unit that's going to play where not everyone is looking just to shoot. I think sprinkling in Vince with your better players as someone who totally defers and just defends and rebounds is going to help. I think having Conchar play minutes, having Tillman and Bismack both be in the rotation just to get defensive and offensive rebounds is going to be a useful thing for this Grizzlies team. Now, the Grizzlies now, what, they've had 1-4, lost three since John Morant returned. Of course, John Morant missed one of those games, the blowout loss to the Nuggets. In the sixth game John Morant has played, they've been down by at least 12 points in five of them. Of course, they've come back and won three of those, but still, they're down in the second halves of virtually every single game. I think that highlights just things are not okay with this team. I know it's a long season, and they still have over 50 games to kind of right the ship, but you are running out of time. Right now, you're 10 and 22. My target for the Grizzlies was 43 wins to make the play-in. I thought it would take being over 500 this year to make the play-in in the West. Maybe not. Right now, the ninth and 10th seeds in the Western Conference are both 500. That's the Rockets and the Lakers. The Warriors are in 11th. They're two games under 500. So maybe 41 wins does it, or 42 wins does it. To get to 42 wins, you have to finish 32 and 18. That feels like a tough ask. That's winning 64% of your final games. That feels like um, it's going to be really hard to do. Because you still have these shooting issues. You have these rebounding issues. You have the old problem with the center position. I mean, maybe something to be optimistic about is the fact that the Grizzlies have historically been great in January under Taylor Jenkins. I mean, I'd like to be clear. That has no predictive value whatsoever. But it would be good if they could rally and have another good January. Um. Anyways, let's close up with this. Uh, I forgot to mention it last episode. John ja Morant, he won Western Conference Player of the Week for his first three games he played of the season. That was the third career Western Conference Player of the Week award for Ja. His other two came in consecutive weeks in January of 2022. So hopefully, um, starting on Tuesday, the Grizzlies can kick off the new year in style. They play the... Raptors this week, and they play the Spurs. And I've been getting the schedule wrong, um, so let me double-check. All right, so the Spurs are the first one. Back-to-back home games on Tuesday and Wednesday. First one is against the San Antonio Spurs, and the second one is, is, is against the Toronto Raptors. Of course, the Spurs have Victor Wimbanyama, who's been doing some especially ridiculous things of late in a good way. And then the Raptors will be the new-look Raptors as they have new players in Emmanuel quickly and RJ Barrett. And then after that, I mean, it's a gauntlet of a schedule. You're going on the road to the Lakers, to the Suns, to the Mavericks. Then you come home, play the Clippers, play the Knicks, play the Warriors. That is the TNT game on Martin Luther King Day. Then you have to go on the road at the Timberwolves, the number one 
seed in the Western Conference at the Bulls, at the Raptors, at the Heat. Um, then you finish the month of January playing the Magic, the Pacers, and the Kings. There are not very many easy, winnable games on this schedule. The ones you would circle are the ones this week against the Spurs and the Raptors. So you better not mess around. You better go get it. Anyways, I appreciate all of you guys, as always, for listening. Especially appreciate those of you who have joined the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Fast Break Breakfast to support the show. Hope you guys have a great Monday. I'll talk to you soon. Go Grizz.